on the recording. Okay. Done. So thank you very much uh, and special thanks uh, uh, both to Professor Kaspar and uh, and Bulgarian friends for allowing me to to present some views and some lectures uh, originally uh, prepared for the Kurs conservation policy at the Faculty of the Environment Science at the Czech University of Life Sciences. I would like to rather change the topic because the topic definitely will not be forest. It will be next Thursday, uh, second part of presentation, but this should be a topic uh, about international nature conservation. And because the same topic is uh, planned for the first part of the next and last uh, presentation, I will try to merge it and to make it short, but still I would like to, to continue in this topic because I consider really that this is the most important part that means about global biodiversity and also at the, same, at the same time I'm sure that about the international nature conservation issue there is a lot of information available on internet and on textbooks but what I would like is uh, now first to finish this topic I'm sure that it will be not so because we are very close but still I would, li I would like uh, really to continue not to interrupt uh, the topic because the next one can be merged. The title is the same. That is the Roman two. So I can uh, really prepare next presentation if we will not be able to go through. And I would like to continue with this because this is, I guess, issue which is, in my opinion, of utmost importance uh, with respect of the topic and also the most current one. And uh, I, as I mentioned, I will try to also to use very recent uh, data and information which definitely some of them are even not available on internet. So I would like to continue this and uh, if we will finish it, so we can then turn to the original title about the international nature conservation issue. Let me remind uh, us that, that I'm now going to continue with the uh, listing the issues or the main drivers of biodiversity loss at the global level, because these are in the fact issue if we would like uh, really uh, it was said by alfred brem if we will wish to conserve and protect nature we should first to know it and we should know where where is the danger so i would like to continue with the third most important driver of biodiversity loss at a global level and this is over exploitation and now uh, you can see this is the figure i prepared for some some uh, lecture in Czech for Charles University. And I would like to demonstrate to you two issues. On the left, what is, this is the, the global catch of marine fish. As you can see on the figure, on the graph, it peaked somewhere in 1988. And since that time, it has been declining or being stable. So what we can see that since the late 1980s, we are not able to gather from the world ocean more fish. That means that there is no increase in the global marine fish harvest or global marine fish yield. And on the other hand, what you can see on the graph or on the figure right this is the average deep of the sea where most marine fish are being catched and as you can see we are moving more and more to deeper water that means simply said fishermen should go far and far from the coast because up to the late 1980s most fish were taken very close to the coast in the territorial waters of the particular states or or in the 
exclusive economic zone that means two miles from the coast maximally that means that there is less and less fish to be caught than it was even 20 years ago and what is the biggest problem with the global fishery is that 70 percent of the fish stock of commercially important species have been overfished that means that in the 70 percent of the fish stock the pressure from fishery is so strong that the stock is not able to produce more young fish and it is stable or declining it is called overfishing that means that the, the pressure from fishery is so huge that the population has not been viable from a long term and you can see that it is 70 percent of commercial important species like tuna cold and so on and this is really problem because at this moment there is only one ocean which has not been overfished and this is indian ocean atlantic pacific and south oceans are overfished that means to be to be very simple that they are not able to produce more fish and that the harvest has been declining there and and will be declining because simply said the fish stock the fish population are not able to really to buffer the number of fish caught by young uh, rearing fish but if we will say okay then we will ban fishery in some part of the world but we can do it very carefully because at the same time only in asia one billion people depends on fish as the main protein sources that means that for them the main protein uh, sources is not uh, cattle meat or or um, chicken meat or but th these are fish and this is very important because one billion people only in asia this is twice as the human population of the european union for 200 million people this is situation even more dramatic fish is not only the main source of the protein but this is the main source of food that means they really buy their lives on what is produced and what is coming from the sea as a food for them on the other hand because of so decline on fish stock available that means that fisheries have to be subsidized this is the case of for example in the european union because you know that in the european union that uh, we have got uh, the common fishery policy and in the fact fish is uh, fishery is subsidized twice one when fishermen are on the sea uh, and uh, the other is there is also strong subsidy for the product when it is exported and uh, that means that from an economic point of view and i would like to stress the wording from the economic point of view fisheries have not been more profitable that means that you will have more invest than you will gather from it but this is so important source of of uh, food and and uh, animal protein that we should not say okay then we will leave it and therefore the global fish catch which has been declining or being stable since the late 1980s and the demand for fish has been increasing it is estimated that for some 
commercial fish species it is really now now 2.5 higher than even 20 years ago that means how where to bring fish to put on the market and the solution is here you can see these photos which i took uh, in thailand and this is that this demand has to be supplied from mariculture as i said uh, uh, earlier uh, let, let me say uh, 15 years ago uh, when i was reading uh, this lecture i said that 18 percent of the fish available on the market comes from the mariculture that means for for breeding artificial breeding of fish yeah. 4 years ago it was 46% and the work the world bank estimates that uh, in 10 years it will be 63% that means that that now it is half to half approximately but but uh, uh, even in 5 6 years there will be more fish from mariculture than from the ocean and this is the only explanation why it is possible that fish has been still available although their stocks are so dramatically declining or being stable at the global level uh, there is also one problem which is totally overlooked and it is not well known you can only rarely read about it and this is so called deep sea bottom trawling and uh, deep sea bottom trawling means that uh, you are trawling uh, the fish net which is supplied with heavy blocks of cement or with heavy uh, metal blocks just on the bottom you are moving with the net on the bottom and image the situation that this is something which cannot be seen for us so for many people this is something which is which uh, they are not familiar with something which is not visible but each year it is estimated that 15 million square kilometers of seabed are destroyed because most of the sea bottoms are formed from sands i image the situation then that you have sands and now there is big rural moving like when you are uh, moving for example when, when uh, uh, you are moving uh, uh, your meadow close your that means uh, side by side we couldn't see it it is uh, by by the way it is a uh, very polite estimation some estimations are saying that this is uh, even more saying that up to 10 times more this is a very standard one but you can image that, that this is a really huge one and uh, uh, you can uh, really image the situation that if this bottom uh, deep sea bottom trolling is carried out the bottom is totally destroyed and even you can see if you will go to google you can see even from satellites something like cloud of this uh, sand particles and you can see where this practice has been or, or being applied what's the problem the problem is that uh, these bottom are uh, this bot uh, bottom trolling is able to to catch fish from four kilometers that means where there is no light uh, there is really problem um, for let me say um, ordinary fish species to live but the fish the deep sea fish are extremely vulnerable because this was very stable environment before starting with this deep sea bottom trolling uh, 
and they are simply not able to really to adapt themselves and their mortality is much more higher than mortality of fish taken for the surface water. And what is the problem? It, the, the, at this moment, there are only 14 countries having this equipment to do it, 14 from 193. And sorry to say, we were not able really to move with this problem. Even if half of these countries are EU member states, because this is relatively popular in, in, in countries like Netherlands, Spain, France, but also Baltic republics. And it is um, relatively profitable because really you are reaching fish communities or fish stock which have not been reached before. Uh, now we are um, trying to repeat the, the attempt to control it uh, and I will be speaking about it when reaching the um, international water law. But this is a very important issue. Some countries um, has come to control it, like New Zealand and so on. But still, this is relatively increasing practice, which is not so known even among nature conservationists, because the problem is far, or better said, too deep from us. Uh, the another problem we are facing with uh, fishery from point of point of view of nature conservation is so-called bycatch this discard. And this is that uh, the case when, for example, non-target fish species is uh, caught or if uh, we were able to catch only smaller fish individuals than required, then uh, this is called discard. That means that uh, this is something which is um, when when the uh, the fish is caught, sometimes uh, even killed, and then throw back in the sea. And according to the latest data, you can see that we have a huge uh, number range. And this is caused that 10% is official data from FAO, Food and uh, Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. 40% of the global catch is in the fact uh, uh, the information from scientists and from NGOs. That means if this would be only 20% that that means that that 5% of the fish which is considered to be a waste and in addition not only non targeted fish is being is being caught by fishermen but there are also non target animals killed because as i mentioned in the situation that uh, uh, the current lines of uh, net can be 75 but also 150 kilometers long each five meter there is a bait for small fish and so on and it is uh, uh, not only used by some predators but also this is really a barrier for some uh, marine species and uh, the so-called bycatch, non-target animals, are namely birds, but also uh, sharks, some squids, and uh, also, unfortunately, one of the most written animal groups, and these are marine turtles. It is estimated, and again, this is, uh, in my opinion, a real realistic estimate, Estimation is that 300,000 uh, birds are annually killed because of this non-target uh, capturing by nets. Of them, unfortunately, mm, 100,000 are the kings of the air and this really majestic uh, albatrosses. Mm. Tragedy, if I may say, of this uh, 
non-target animal bycatch is that this is not about the deep sea bottom trawling. We have now measures how to do it. For example, uh, yeah. the the size of the cells in the net, or or for for the marine marine dental, some diodes can be used. That means that there are there are relatively cheap ways how to reduce this uh, non-target animal bycatch but the problem is that uh, uh, there are not so much countries where it is possible to done it and that means that in the fact most uh, countries uh, are unfortunately tolerant to it and uh, therefore although there is a really huge effort from some scientists uh, namely american and british still this bycatch um, has not been increasing as we wish because uh, i must to say that uh, the, it peaked in the 1970s then declined but now we are back that means that we know that it is possible to do but there is not strong pressure on fishery industry to do it you can see but on the other end of course the uh, fishery is, is, is hard profession uh, you can see these are uh, uh, fishermen on the island of Regen in uh, north Germany uh, and, and they are uh, uh, really uh, handling with the catch but these are uh, Germany has quite strong um, regulation with respect of by catch um, I have to say Um, the problem is uh, that uh, we have known how to really introduce and, uh, and uh, carry out sustainable fishery. I was speaking about it the last time because uh, we know uh, we are able to calculate uh, very precisely maximum sustainable yield. That means that we are able to provide uh, politicians and decision makers with the relatively precise quotas for the particular commercial fish species uh, because we are able really to calculate relatively precisely mathematical models because as i mentioned we know it uh, uh, because uh, there is a possibility to uh, come with the relatively precise life tables because we are able to when sampling fish, we are able to say the cohort that means how old the species, the fish is even in months, sometimes in weeks, because of the circles um, uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the pins. Uh, so the, the age structure of uh, fish stocks is uh, relatively easy to be to be found, and this is. Uh, problem again uh, that uh, in the European Union uh, uh, although the the common fishery policy should be based on maximum sustainable yield very often it is not uh, respected that means that for example for the uh, tuna species scientists uh, advice to the European Commission to have quota as, a, as an example for example 10,000 tons um, the commission will start to negotiate with the member states they will agree 20,000 uh, tons and at the end the, the, the catch is 40,000 tons and next year again that means that but this is a really problem as i mentioned the problem with the european union fisheries that is twice subsidized and there was a nice article in the journal nature some years ago when it was confirmed when for example spanish and french and fishery ships these big factories where are really handling with the catcher just on the on the board 
uh, when they arrive into uh, Bay of Guinea in uh, West Africa, these small fishermen are not able to compete because these big uh, ships uh, are able to catch almost everything. And the result is that they, that means these people, these Africans, have to come um, to rainforests and to kill gorillas for bushmeat. There is very strong correlation among it. And then you can see, okay, we can uh, apply the similar approach like uh, we have used uh, to done in the terrestrial or land environment. That means try to establish the marine protected areas. The trouble here is that uh, most of uh, the protected uh, areas on the seas are in the both uh, territorial zones. These are part of the of the country according to international law or the exclusive economic zone. That means close to 200 miles from the coast. But 77% of the world ocean is in deep seas or in international waters. That means that there are there are behind the jurisdiction of any country. And now the question is, who should manage it? Who should be in charge of such protected areas? Who should enforce it? And the response is that we have quite less marine protected areas by size than the terrestrial one. And uh, at the same time, these uh, marine protected areas, some of them are very huge uh, because they were established by some countries like uh, uh, close to Hawaii, uh, half a million square kilometer, or, or close to Cook Island, established by the United Kingdom. But they cannot be managed, but they are so huge. So the establishment uh, of these marine protected areas is sometimes rather formal. And unfortunately, only if, uh, minority of them are so-called no-take ones. That means that uh, nothing is permitted to be taken from the sea. But we have a lot of marine protected areas where, for example, fishery is allowed or, for example, drilling of some some oil or, or natural gas is also allowed, for example, not to, to catch fish, but to drill some resources, it is allowed, but we need to have really no take ones. That means really protected areas in the seas where nothing can be taken, not only fish. And this is the problem. Uh, now you can see uh, on, on the uh, photo uh, right, this is a uh, 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 fish harvest. I took a photo uh, and uh, at uh, one fish market in uh, the uh, Senegalese uh, coast. And how to go forward with this issue? Uh, we are trying to do it uh, through because uh, namely some pressure from some important countries like uh, uh, the United States but also European Union and, and uh, for example Australia but on the other hand uh, in favor are not countries also important countries like China, Japan, Turkey and, and we are now very close uh, hoping but, but uh, or better said uh, I was hoping uh, before this uh, pandemic pandemic because uh, by the end of this year it is expected that uh, we will come with the sp special agreement under the UNCLOS. The UNCLOS is abbreviation United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea 
and this is the most important piece of legislation, global piece of legislation, which is dealing with the international waters and also with the territorial waters or econ exclusive economic zones of the countries, uh, simply said with the, with, the, with the law of the seas. Uh, we, prepare, uh, we prepared an uh, agreement aiming, because where is the problem? The problem of the UNCLOS is similar to the International Convention on Whaling. That means that UNCLOS is an agreement, a legal agreement, not on conservation of the sea, but on its use. And one issue of what is here is that any nation has a right, for example, to use the international waters. And now in the situation that we are coming and saying, not so much guys, you should be sustainable. You can use it, but in a sustainable way. And in some part where there are fragile ecosystem, marine ecosystem, no human activities uh, could, be pro uh, could be permitted. But we have prepared it and hoping that uh, by the end of the year we will be able to come in with the text agreed and uh, to send it uh, in 2021 to the General Assembly of the United Nations to be approved and adopted. There is also a problem that uh, there are some countries which simply have not becoming a party to UNCLOS. That means that the commitments from this uh, international law, they are not uh, able and willing to respect. And uh, as I mentioned, there is strong uh, resistance from some countries saying, why, why you are coming with the, with the new regulation? Because international waters, waters were all, always free. When Cristobal uh, Colon uh, come from Spain uh, to discover America, he did it without uh, any permission. And this is really, again about the necessity to change the thinking of people because they said okay we have some so-called regional sea agreements for example on the mediterranean on the baltic on the southern part of the indian ocean where there is said for example there are some quotas and so on and and you know now with, with technology it, it would be relatively easy for example because you know that, that each legal fishery ship or boat has to have so-called automatic identification system. This is the continuing information coming uh, from the radar. That means that officially we are able using the satellites to find any fishery ship. But the problem is that those who are poachers, of course, did not respect this duty. Or there are some countries which are, for example, willing to say where they are in the inter international waters and when they come to the territory of others, some countries, they stop the, the radiation signal. And now it is only as a, as, a, as a, let me say, interesting way that now albatrosses are really helping us because uh, French scientists provide them with the transmitters and because they are attracted to the fishery ships, they come back 
and uh, although these poachers uh, do not uh, emit the the signal the, the this uh, automatic identification system they had to use uh, a radar for navigation that means that now unfortunately it was recognized and it was published last month that it is estimated that almost 20 percent of the fishery ships in the southern uh, indian ocean close between uh, madagascar and, and uh, kerguelen's and, and french uh, sector in antarctis and that they are illegal this is quite a high number that means that that, that uh, each fifth uh, fishery ships uh, is, is really illegal and uh, uh, not in any statistics for example that means that that, that pressure from uh, the fishery is even bigger than than, than official set uh, uh, i'm sure that, that this is the uh, this is the problem so um, please cross the finger for us to negotiate uh, but uh, it seems to me that it will be shifted because uh, Yesterday I got the information because we we will uh, shall to have to meet uh, in uh, mid May and now it was shifted to the late August but I'm not sure whether it will be because some countries uh, really insisting to have face to face meeting. So uh, I will be uh, continuing and saying that another type of the. Uh, over exploitation is something which is called bushmeat and uh, bushmeat are really proteins from wild animals originally the term was related to the tropics and subtropics but now it's used for even for uh, poaching of uh, wild animals in temperate zone like for example in siberia and so on and it returns approximately 80% of forest mammal species in southeastern Asia. And uh, the problem is not, uh, let me say, um, the traditional hunting of white animals like it was um, 30 years ago when, for example, people living in the rainforest or in savannas uh, went uh, for uh, white animals and, and uh, for example, they visited. Uh, a site twice a month it was not problem and that is this um, subsistence so-called the subsistence hunting the problem has appeared in the situation when more and more people are moving to cities and they are asking to have wild meat and then instead uh, really feeding only their families or their tribes people are professionals in animal hunting and sometimes it is even the situation when they are not able to for example to visit their traps and, and there are some dead animals in traps for example two three months and so on and and uh, this is a um, really the problem in some part of the world in uh, South America, in Africa, and namely in Southeastern Asia. And even um, uh, some, this and the tradition is so uh, strong that there was um, um, a story some years ago, uh, there was a director of department at the, one of the French minister of Cameroon origin, the fifth generation living in Europe, and uh, he he had been supplied with with uh, wild uh, animals, meat from Africa, and you know that the problem is even if there is tradition, for example, when uh, some people believe that if they eat some white animal, they will be stronger, and unfortunately, you know that this is now the the great problem in Africa for great apes 
both the uh, chimpanzees and gorillas, which are very often um, eaten and, and exported also to Europe or to North America. And, but this is true, but on the other hand, uh, we should not only say to, to, to people doing this, you are, you are bad boys and so on. We should really offer them another source of, of meat or proteins, because it is very simple to say, don't do it. But what else? There are uh, some uh, approaches which have been developed. We prepared, for example, some list of uh, alternative food during conventional biological diversity 10 years ago. And uh, the uh, future of this bushmeat, sometimes it is uh, called uh, uh, bushmeat crisis, is and the output is empty forest syndrome. That means that forest has been here, but but there is almost no animals because they were they were uh, uh, caught for or killed for for meat. And uh, by the way, uh, I said it uh, during my first presentation, but I can say it for those who are not uh, uh, there. And uh, that um, uh, in it was in, in uh, 2002. Uh, I chaired at the time the scientific panel of the Convention on Biological Diversity, and it was um, 2 a.m. and there was a call from Montreal, and where the secretariat is based, and uh, my colleagues, uh, because they they. Uh, I had not remembered that there is six uh, hour shift between uh, North American and Central European time. And they called me and asked me what to do because they uh, received a letter from the United States uh, uh, State Secretary. This is, you know, that this is uh, the, the same like the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Europe. And uh, he asked us not to use the word Bushmeat because it was under President Bush presidency to avoid this. So I uh, wrote a letter saying that this is Terminus Technicus, uh, which appeared just a long time before um, President Bush uh, took his office. And there's a joke, so I proposed that we are not uh, going to speak about bushmeat, but we are going to speak about Blair meat because English uh, people are much more tolerant to us. But it was the job, but they, they accepted it. But only when I see on, on, on my screen the word bushmeat, I always remember this story. And uh, what are the alternative uh, food resources? Uh, two days ago, I mentioned so-called New Green Revolution. This is the idea that we can feed um, uh, uh, the, whole, uh, the, the whole humankind when uh, we will be able to have also in developing uh, worth the same harvest like in the developed countries. And the new green revolution is the idea that we can use the high techs like drones, like uh, providing the individual plant with water uh, drones for uh, pesticides, uh, pesticides of the 10th generation really uh, re uh, really targeting the pest, not, not the, the plant and so on. And uh, again, I have to say that there is a lot of work to provide the alternative features instead of bushmeat, for example, in Africa. It is funded uh, by the Bill Gates uh, Foundation. And um, I'm sure that you will not be surprised that the, the most common alternative uh, to bushmeat should be chicken meat because it is cheap. It is also uh, uh, having uh, some level of proteins and, and, and can be done. And it is uh, strongly financially supported 
by Bill Gates and, and some other uh, US private foundations. This was about bushmeat and the third way or third situation when we have been facing the problem of over exploitation is uh, you can see from the cartoon and this is international trade in wildlife because this is the third most profitable commodity after narcotics and, and weapons because image the situation somebody will buy uh, will buy from a, a, a native people in amazonia a parrot for five us dollars when move from the jungle to port like uh, sao paulo or rio de janeiro then the price is 50 dollars then it is moved to the United States and in the United States it can be somewhere in California. It uh, can be uh, really sold for 500. And uh, somewhere uh, on the market you can buy it for 5,000 American dollars. That means really highly profitable even when speaking about legal, not speaking about illegal, it is the same. Uh, the annual global volume is estimated. There are various estimations again, but what is the most respected is that it is up approximately 170 billion US dollars, the amount of, and timber and fish are not included in this number. And unfortunately, with this, uh, an uh, illegal um, international trade, hundreds of, of millions of wildlife in, individuals are involved. And uh, this is a really problem uh, for some taxa or groups, uh, which are the most often trade, like cacti, namely from Mexico, but also, for example, from Peru, orchids, uh, tropical orchids, uh, namely from uh, Southeast Asia, white medicinal herbs, China, Turkey, coral reef fish, there is a huge market namely in the US and in the UK, because you know that due to uh, technological development, we are able to have uh, a really aquarium with the artificial coral reef even on our tables. 30 years ago it was uh, really only seen in the, in the best uh, uh, professional marine aquaria as institutions now you can establish or you can create yourself. Surgeons, namely caviar, you know this is a real problem not only because of um, a really a uh, uh, luxury meal, but uh, most of caviar is used uh, in cosmetics. So it is not only because people like it, uh, like uh, it, but uh, also because they uh, they like to have various cosmetics uh, for their skins and so on. Uh, reptiles, turtles, uh, crocodiles. And parrots. Uh, some uh, reptiles, uh, fortunately, can be ranch. That means can be uh, produced uh, in farms, like crocodiles. The uh, let me say demand from uh, crocodile skins from the wild has been increasing because the market is fed uh, from the farms in South uh, Eastern Asia or or uh, alligators uh, farms and so on. Um, on the photo you can see uh, the green iguana, uh, which is also a farm and ranch it. And um, I took a photo just uh, before Christmas in Mexico, because in Mexico, this is a traditional Christmas time uh, meal. And, uh, but on the other hand, the problem is uh, with the 
fact that uh, in some countries uh, we are not sure uh, whether some animals which are declared for international trade dry, under CITES, uh, we, we are going to deal with this later, whether these animals are really illegally reared in the farms or ranches where, or whether they are taken uh, from the wild and declared to be reared. So therefore, for example, when there is some requirement to the European Union, we have a special scientific review group on this um, meeting uh, twice uh, uh, in, a, in a half of the year and debating and we are very often asking the, the authorities from the country to provide us with information because uh, really uh, uh, it is uh, like, like, like uh, uh, dirty money washing. Uh, money is not over here, but, but the, the, the plants or, or animals are always there. And, and primates, because primates are uh, not uh, used uh, so uh, frequently in labs, fortunately, because uh, even it is prohibited in some countries to use um, monkeys or great apes for labs uh, experiments. In some countries, you know that, for example, Spain was the first country where great apes are officially, have the same rights like humans officially. But uh, there are still some countries where this is uh, done, namely in some countries in Southeastern Asia, unfortunately, where for example, 20 years ago, there was a fashion from rich people in Hong Kong or Singapore or Malaysia to have a, a trained orangutan uh, to, to serve meals. And, they, and, and all these orangutans uh, were taken illegally from, from the rainforest in, in Indonesia or Malaysia. And I would like to uh, provide us uh, with these three examples. Um, we have uh, still some time. And uh, this is uh, first uh, where the illegal trade is really uh, making problems for uh, white living populations, um, elephants. This is called wildlife crime. And in this three case, I'm going to show to you this is organized crimes. They have these same patterns like cybercrime, like narcotics, like, like human trafficking. This is organized, this is, and unfortunately, from this dirty money, also, for example, terrorism is, is paid in some parts of Africa. And, and uh, African elephants. Uh, it is estimated that uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, there was 10 million of African elephants in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. But uh, the, the demand for ivory was so high that in 1989, one million left and the elephants, the ivory uh, has been since that time protected under the CITES, under the Convention on the uh, uh, Trade with Endangered Species of white fauna and flora. That means that, that, that uh, in the fact trade with uh, ivory has been prohibited. But where is the problem? The problem is that uh, there is still high demand from ivory, namely from China, because a part of the traditional crafting, but also from Japan, because in Japan there is a long-term tradition even having high technology that you are not undersigned the documents, but you have the, your family seal. And this seal is produced from ivory. And uh, this is called high coin. This, there is still high demand for it. And this is the, the, the numbers uh, of uh, African elephant left. And uh, 
there, uh, there has been a boom of poaching starting approximately 10 years ago. Uh, there is a good news that uh, in uh, the last year there was a decline in number of uh, African elephants poached. And, uh, but on the other hand, image the situation, there is uh, 350,000 uh, uh, African elephant left in the wild and almost 80% are only in four African states. Uh, they are the South Africa, Botswana, Namibia and Zimbabwe. And image the situation, these countries are saying, you know, we have been able to manage our herds, contrary to countries where elephant uh, uh, were really becoming extinct because of hunting and poaching. We have problem because we have too many elephants. They are destroying our fields and our villages and we can control them. And now you are not allowing us to purchase the ivory, although it is legal. And although we can promise to you that the money raised from the purchase of the ivory will be used back for their conservation and for the original development of villages uh, suffering from the attacks of elephants. And uh, there was huge debate. Uh, it was approved twice in the past that it was officially allowed to these countries uh, to offer the ivory from the, from the legal killed elephants to China and Japan. But I remember I was when it, it was for the first time I was uh, in the Czech television tried to explain it and uh, I said that this is in the fact conflict of two approaches. One is to to strictly protect the species, including international trade to it, saying that any exception means to open the door. And the second, to give the chance to those who are able to manage it in the right way to, to be a little profit, profitable, to, to have a little profit from it. And uh, at the time I, I said, uh, Let's try it. But now, to be honest, it is clear that it opened the door to the to the poaching and to the uh, more illegal trade with the with the elephants. And uh, really, now this is the problem because there is more and more elephant in these four countries. And we, for example, debated it uh, last August in Geneva, the CITES World Conference, and. Sometimes, uh, really, it seems to me that for the future, it is not the solution that we, we can do. And the the way how to proceed further, not only with the ivory, is really to try not to enforce everything only, because more effort and enforce means more more poaching, because poachers are always a step forward to us having better technology than these rangers in, these poor rangers in, in, in African countries using helicopters and, and the internet and everything and have special tactics. They are not killing elephants all the years. They have, for example, two great attacks, killed hundreds of them and two sites in Africa. And they are not smuggling them from 100 uh, sites. They are smuggling them only twice from two ports. That means that there is a, a less chance uh, to be captured by police and enforcement uh, authorities. And uh, therefore, the way how to do it is really to, to decrease demand. To really to try to explain this who are demanding ivory, why it is not uh, so, so good uh, thing to do it. Because for example, we were relatively successful in parrots because uh, 30 years ago, it was a really huge problem. It was, there were millions and millions of great uh, parrots to the US, United Kingdom and so on. And there was, I remember quite a, a, quite a nice campaign in uh, some parts uh, of the world, for example, in the United Kingdom, it was, there was a slogan, 
buy your Englishman. And children were asked when they are going to buy a parrot to ask, uh, in the fact, uh, a clerk whether the parrot was born in the UK and whether they can confirm it, whether the, uh, the parrot is not from the, from the wild. And it dramatically decreased the, the demand from wild parrots in the UK. And we can probably do it in, in this in this way. That means that this is the the issue of the total ban versus controlled purchase. The very similar issue, but even more worse, is the issue with this uh, uh, guy, and, and this is with the wildlife crown with the rhino horn, because the rhino horn is uh, used in traditional Asian medicine. And now the price, uh, because uh, uh, there is only uh, 3,000 uh, uh, rhinos left in Asia. So most uh, of the black market is uh, supplied from Africa. And uh, now the price per uh, one kilogram of this rhino horn is uh, in the fact uh, 60,000 US dollars per kilogram. This is more than uh, one kilogram of gold or cocaine. And uh, you can see on the graph uh, in the upper part of the sheet, um, the dynamic of the, this is the number of rhino poach in South Africa, only South Africa is a country, the Republic of the South Africa. You can see then that there were 13 rhinos poached in uh, 27 and it peaked uh, here in, in, uh, in uh, 2014, uh, 1215 killed. And, and the, this is again the, the issue of the demand and, and what, what to do with this, because there is a rapid, a rapid uh, growth uh, in Africa of poaching. The poachers are professionals. They have uh, good technology. Uh, not only good uh, guns, but uh, using helicopters have perfect system of the uh, handling uh, the killed animal and so on. But uh, on the other hand, we are able now, we have uh, uh, quite good databases of the DNA fingerprinting from, from uh, not only killed rhinos and rhinos in the zoos, but also from the rhinos in farms and, and uh, also uh, from rhinos from the wild. So uh, now um, there was some uh, sentence uh, in South Africa, some poachers was put in, in the arrest for, um, I guess, eight years because there was the, the evidence based on DNA fingerprinting of the rhino. But sometimes it is um, be because in the past it was um, namely in China now, we can see some movement of the demand now. The country having the, the greatest demand for rhino horns is Vietnam. And it was because uh, some time ago, ago, a minister of uh, health of Vietnam said that uh, his mother uh, had uh, been uh, suffering from uh, cancer and she recovered because of rhino horn and at the time the the, the demand from Vietnam from rhino horn started including we have some cases in the Czech Republic when uh, members of our Vietnam's, uh, Vietnamese uh, community uh, were uh, able to recruit some poor people send them to South Africa as legal hunters for trophy then they came back and uh, the horn disappeared but we have quite good police action against it. But uh, unfortunately in these countries, this is now, now I'm sure that, that, that uh, most uh, people uh, really believe that this is really, uh, that there is, there is really some, some medical effect on the human health, but some people simply don't believe it uh, because it was tested uh, by, uh, uh, some universities and except of the University of Hong Kong, it was found that there is no medical treatment effect of this rhino horn, but for 
many people this is as a evidence of their social status that they are able to buy it like to buy uh, expensive cars or or, or have uh, the desert villas or 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 two yachts that you should have uh, in these countries uh, Rhinehorn to really to to prove that you are you are really somebody and then and, and uh, the, this is the the problem on the other hand there is similar situation in uh, south africa because this uh, species which is the most numerous and, and, and now most suffering this is southern white rhino Cerozoterium simum simum uh, has been uh, uh, really saved uh, a century ago by south african farmers at the time there was probably 60 rhino left and they they started to breed them uh, on their farms and now they are some farmers having uh, some thousands of rhinos on their lands and they said why we are not allowed it i save the species i'm investing i have uh, persons to patrol each rhino individuals it is expensive i have fingerprinting of dna for each horn of my rhinos and i'm not allowed to official to 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 purchase it and 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 and, and to sort it and, and and to invest back money so it is also a huge debate on the international fora about this but again uh, we have the, the, the evidence that uh, if this has been done uh, in the past, uh, that uh, the, the illegal poaching uh, uh, boomed. The last uh, is the wildlife crime is uh, the tiger, because all parts of its body, particularly bones, are highly demanded in East Asia in traditional medicine. And, uh, and on one side, this is the single species uh, when the highest financial finances were put in its con uh, conservation. No more money has been spent in the history of humankind for single species, like for the protection of tigers, you know, that there was even summit in St. Petersburg hosted by the Russian President Putin that, that uh, the uh, countries uh, with, the, with the distribution ranges of tigers agreed to, to conserve, to protect tigers. They spent a lot of time and human resources and uh, uh, since uh, 2014 uh, the numbers of uh, tigers for the first time in the history has been increasing in the wild. But still, to be honest, uh, when uh, I'm asked by general public when having lectures for um, general public, uh, whether there is a chance for tigers, I have to say that if there will be no change in the thinking of, 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 of people in, in China, um, I uh, I have uh, serious doubts because if 1.4 billion people is asking any single part of the tiger and in the wild there is still uh, five, six thousands and there is no chance for them. And we can really uh, again uh, do everything to change the demand but also an enforcement because uh, this is photo from the 2018 in summer, there was a, a long-term uh, action carried out by the Czech Environment, uh, Environmental Inspectorate and Czech Police because they were really uh, monitoring uh, uh, some members of our Vietnamese community who uh, were buying uh, tigers from private owners in the Czech Republic and you can see this was this was uh, recently killed tiger prepared uh, to uh, prepare for uh, from this tiger so-called uh, so-called tiger soup this is a, a special uh, um, uh, special 
Marie, let, let me say, reached the how to do it, and it is believed that this is the also this is almost a, a miracle, and it was produced just at the site, but uh, police were there and and they arrested uh, three persons. Uh, one was the keeper, one was the Vietnamese head of this Vietnamese mafia, and and the third was. Uh, man who was uh, able to uh, to to digest uh, and to prepare all these uh, medicaments and so on but again this is the the question of, of demand and still having five minutes so i will be now uh, because we are almost at the end and i would like to mention the fourth uh, important uh, driver of biodiversity loss and these are diseases honey creepers as you can see here uh, on the photos on Hawaii, I was not able to take a photo because they were so quick. So I, even I was in the early morning in, in, in the forest seeking for them, but they are really uh, quick and immediately disappeared, even having uh, tele objective, objective. And uh, th this is honey creepers. This is the endemic uh, family or subfamily of this very attractive species. Uh, this is the second from left and the first from the right. And uh, they are suffering from avian malaria on the Hawaiian islands, uh, which appeared there at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it was uh, introduced with water, with fresh water. And there was a plasmodium, the 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 protozoan uh, being a vector and vector is uh, being a source vector is of course um, anopheles mosquito and uh, the disease has exterminated all endemic bird species uh, below 1.300 meter about sea level on the island and unfortunately the situation is becoming worse because climate change and this avian malaria is moving higher and higher. And this is really, again, the example of the situation when the, the native animals were totally unprepared for the invasion of the disease. And uh, the other example of the disease is this uh, pandemic uh, fungal disease, uh, Hytridiomycosis in amphibians, particularly frogs, as you can see here. Uh, but this is, this is uh, I took a, a photo in Indonesia. And 90 species have become extinct of amphibians, namely frogs. And uh, there is dramatic decline in more than 500 species. And this is uh, really uh, a disease making problem with the skins and 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 uh, really uh, spreading uh, very much because originally it was considered that this is a problem only in tropics then appeared in temperate countries even in countries like central asia and unfortunately there is a very similar disease but caused by uh, a close uh, related uh, protozoan now, which is because originally it was in frogs, but now also caudata, like salamanders or newts are affected. And uh, one of the really, I'm sure that you have heard it about it and that my students have heard uh, from um, uh, the colleagues dealing with this, because for example, Professor Voyar from the Department of Ecology is dealing with this issue as and he is one of the European leading expert on this issue, how to handle and uh, what to do to, to stop this disease among, among frogs. Climate change, uh, I will be very simple that by the end of this century, climate change uh, is supposed to be the main driver of biodiversity decline and loss globally. No habitat fragmentation, uh, destruction, and loss, but climate change and uh, ecosystem respond to climate change through individual species or guilds. And they, they have three possibilities, species, to adapt themselves 
or to move to following their climate zone, zones either towards the poles or to higher elevation or to become extinct. Protected areas should have broad range of micro or mesoclimatic condition. That means that it is very clear at this moment that, that most species which are protected in current protected areas will move from the protected areas because of unsuitable climatic condition. And the question is, are we have been prepared for this? And therefore, let me remind uh, us connectivity. We were debating before and also, also adaptive management. We were dealing with this issue uh, two days ago. And there is something assisted colonization. The idea is why should not we help with these species to move them to the better condition? For example, there is a critical, critically endangered uh, Iberian lynx um, inhabiting uh, some part of Spain, for example, Doniana. And the idea, why should not we uh, be seeking for uh, suitable future habitats, for example, in England? If the England will, is supposed to have the same climate like Spain in 2030s. So, and now the debate is whether we should assist, whether we should move, whether we should translocate the species to the, to the um, part of the world where they have never been native. And the debate at this moment, some scientists say yes, but some scientists say no, because probably we should do it uh, step by step. This, this is from, uh, from uh, the, uh, the national park in the Canadian uh, province, Quebec. This is taiga, because uh, taiga or northern boreal forest is moving to the north and tundra is declining. The problem will be breaking relation between species due to domino effect or chain reaction, because uh, there will be uh, new predators, there should be new pollinators to the species in new locations. Uh, there will be new competitors. And even more, we are speaking about novel ecosystem. There will be totally new ecosystem in five year, uh, in 50 years. Who knows which mixture of species will be there, which habitats will move. And the, the ecosystem will be totally new. There will be novel and probably ecosystem we have uh, never experienced with. And of course, uh, this is about phenotic plasticity. I will be, I will be uh, uh, quick and I will uh, say that recent research has revealed that evolution often occurs on contemporary time scales, sometimes often within decades. Decade. It is called contemporary revolution. For example, now, uh, you can see in uh, almost each textbook that, that species speciation, establishment or creation of new species uh, is a question of hundreds or thousands of years. But we have now evidences that namely because of human pressures, uh, there are some species which appear newly in 10 years, even in years, for example, some, some anomalous reptiles on the Caribbean. This is famous study uh, by Professor Pianca. Uh, that means that evolution is quicker and quicker. But even if climate change may accelerate evolution in some species, it doesn't guarantee that threatened population will cope in the long run. Simply said, even evolution is quicker and quicker, probably it will be not enough to, to, to follow the, the climate change. And this is about what we should do as nature conservation is that means really to maintain and enhance biodiversity. To be simple, we are speaking about so-called so portfolio effect. Having more and more species, more and more habitats, more and more uh, ecosystem processes means that there is a chance that there will be some of them able to copy with the global change. And let me remind us that we are not speaking anymore on global ecology. We are speaking about global change ecology. 
it is coral bleaching. So uh, simply said, uh, if there are changes in conditions uh, in the sea, uh, corals uh, expel symbiotic algae, causing them turn completely white. It is called coral bleaching. That means that that coral are, corals are dead because the algae uh, living with uh, them in the endosymbiosis, they are not able to survive uh, the increase in water temperature by one, one centigrade. So they are not able to, to really, for example, to, to overcome uh, El Nino or El Nina effect. And for me, it was, it was horrible. I took a photo on Seychelles on one of the marine parks and image the situation if there is coral reef, it is so colorful. There are so many species, so many individuals. There is moving, silence, perfect. And now what you can see, this is the beginning of the coral bleaching. And at the end, you will see something which is similar to the concrete, gray without living. But some species of coral are able to adapt to the situation. There are some studies, but the problem is that there are only some species and only in some sites. For example, close to uh, American Samoa Island in Pacific. And eutrophication, I said it last time, natural diseases like volcano eruption, earthquakes, tsunami, natural fires, but they are affecting namely endemic species. That means that they are namely uh, functioning at the local and regional level. So it was everything from mine and apologize for being so long and now uh, I'm open to any questions or, or views or comments if you are not boring or tired. So any questions or views? There are no questions in the chat for this webinar. Any, any questions from audience, please? Probably people are exhausted enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if not, I would like to well, uh, thank to everybody. Uh, I would like to remind you also that we you can join to our seminar next week. I have sent uh, the links for webinars to the chat, so please uh, copy the links or you can follow us on the Facebook. You can find there also the, the links for the webinars next week, uh, which will be on April 9th. So if there are no questions, Thank you very much. One more and sorry. Okay, one question. Yeah, I have. Uh, do we have more lectures with Professor Plesnik? Yes. Or as, as April told, 9th. Mm -hmm. April 9th told, is the last one. No, no, as I told, uh, two other lectures will be next week on April 9th with Prof with Dr. Plesnik. Yes, and more after 9th of April. No more after 9th April. Okay. Okay. That, that was my question. Mm -hmm. Okay, Thanks. okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks. But um, if you will, in the chat, you can find, uh, you can find a link for our project, edu.parks.bg. And indeed, uh, that is the that is the website of uh, our Erasmus Plus uh, project. And after registering, you can find not just the lectures of Dr. Plesnik, but also um, many other different lectures, toolkits, and face-to-face -face lectures, webinars, and so on uh, from Bulgaria and Greece and Czech Republic as well. So. I, I believe that you will find there a lot of interesting materials. So, uh, if
if I may. Sure. Thank you very much to Professor Kaspar, to our Bulgarian friends. Thank you very much to all the participants uh, at the seminar. And uh, uh, we are going to meet uh, next week. And uh, uh, I wish you staying safe and healthy. Thanks. Thank you very much and have a nice evening and weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.